Thank you all for tuning in to our virtual uh, version of Conversations with the Past. For this talk, I'm going to be discussing a topic that I've always found fascinating, which is that from 1884 to 1954, many people believed that the cure for tuberculosis was right here in the Adirondacks, specifically in Saranac Lake. To begin, let's discuss a little bit of history regarding tuberculosis. On March 24, 1882, Dr. Robert Koch announced the discovery of the bacteria Mycobacterium tuberculosis. This was the bacteria that causes TB. At this time in 1882, TB was killing one out of every seven people in the United States and Europe. It was responsible for killing 14% of the world population in the 1800s. While 1882 is when the official discovery was made, it's estimated that TB existed for approximately 3 million years. It's gone by many names, including consumption, wasting disease, the white plague, the great killer, or tysis. Various names for TB have been recorded in ancient Greek, ancient Rome, uh, in the Hebrew language and the Middle Ages, and so on. At the turn of the 20th century, TB was responsible for more than one third of all deaths for those between the ages of 15 and 35. So it was disproportionately impacting young people. TB, as we've already said, is a bacterium that can attack any part of the human body, such as the kidney, spine, or brain, but what we know it best for is that it tends to attack the lungs. Symptoms would vary depending on where the infection was, but most experience a bad cough, chest pain, coughing up blood or sputum, which is essentially phlegm, weakness and fatigue, weight loss, loss of appetite, chills, fever, or night sweats. There are some who experience no symptoms, uh, but they, carry, they can carry a dormant version of TB, and that can still be spread to others. TB is an airborne illness, spreading when someone infected coughs, speaks, or sings near healthy individuals, and they breathe in the bacteria. Now, for some time, it was actually believed that TB was an inherited disease and that it ran in families. This was likely because people were spreading it to those that they spent the most time with, and that was their families. So despite these symptoms and this heavy prognosis, those who survived this disease actually speak to how it was transformative and how it, they felt better off having had it. And this concept uh, really resonated with patients who were treated at sanatoriums like the one in Saranac Lake. So with that in mind, how did a small town in the Adirondacks become the unofficial capital of tuberculosis recovery and research? Now, the man who started it all was Edward Livingston Trudeau. Trudeau was born in New York City in 1848. He came from a family of physicians. After caring for his brother, who eventually succumbed to TB, at the age of 20, Trudeau enrolled in Columbia University and completed his medical training in 1871. During his second winter in medical school, Trudeau started to feel some fatigue. A doctor examined him and found that nothing was wrong. And while he didn't know it at the time, these were actually his earliest symptoms of tuberculosis. Upon his graduation in 1871, he became the house physician at the Strangers Hospital in New York City Thin and worn out, Trudeau left after just six months. Just eight days later, he married his now wife, Lottie Bear. On their honeymoon, Trudeau notices the lymph nodes in his neck are swollen. He sees a physician and they still don't realize that Trudeau is suffering from the same disease that took his brother. He and Lottie return to New York and he opens a practice on Long Island. Lottie gives birth to their daughter, Charlotte, and for a year, they seem truly happy and at peace. Now the family moves back to New York City in order for Trudeau to advance his profession, but he goes from suffering rare and mild fevers to being constantly fatigued. In 1872, Trudeau was diagnosed with consumption at Bellevue Hospital. 
he had contracted the disease after being his brother's primary caregiver. He was absolutely devastated by this diagnosis. Trudeau was advised to go south and live outdoors, and he followed these orders. Trudeau, Lottie, who was pregnant again with their second child, and their daughter moved to South Carolina in February of 1873. Just two short months later, he has no signs of improving and they return to New York. After losing a substantial amount of weight and continuing to grow sicker and sicker, Trudeau assumed he only had a short time to live. Recalling his fond memories of hunting in the Adirondacks when he was younger, he decided to return. On May 25th, 1873, Trudeau says goodbye to his wife, his daughter, and his one week old son, Ned. He didn't want his family to watch him suffer the way that he had watched his brother suffer years earlier. So Trudeau made his way to Paul Smith's hotel by train, boat, and wagon, and was completely cared for upon his stay. When he arrived, he was actually in the worst condition that he had been in, and they had to carry him up the stairs to his bed. After being cared for so diligently, Trudeau began to feel better even after the first 24 hours. And he realized that his increased energy, appetite and positive outlook was because for the first time, he was completely at rest. He was being cooked delicious meals by Mrs. Smith and he was getting ample amounts of fresh air the Smiths outfitted a guide boat with balsam boughs and blankets so that Trudeau could recline comfortably. They took him around the clear waters of the lake and he began to feel completely rejuvenated. Trudeau actually rejoined his wife by the end of September, going home a very different man than the one who had left and he gained back 15 pounds. However, shortly after returning to the city, his fever returns. He was then advised to winter in St. Paul, Minnesota. It was thought that the plentiful sunshine would have a positive effect on those who were suffering from pulmonary diseases. By spring though, Trudeau was nearly as sick as, as he had been when he arrived at Paul Smith's hotel. So in May of 1874, Trudeau actually journeyed back to the Adirondacks, but this time with his wife and children. But Trudeau wasn't improving the way that he did the first time he was there. After consulting a local physician, Trudeau was instructed to stay through the winter, though the doctor didn't anticipate him living to see the winter. If they were to stay through the winter, they would be completely cut off from the outside world. The nearest doctor was in Plattsburgh, which was a 60 mile carriage ride over very poorly defined roads. And mail arrived three times a week, 10 miles away, in Bloomingdale, and Trudeau would have to convince helpers like Mrs. Smith to stay for the winter as well. After deciding to do it, Trudeau's wife and children made the journey in January of 1875. That winter, the snow reached depths of five feet, which made it difficult for the horses to get through, but Trudeau began to feel markedly improved. After that first year, Trudeau and his family rented a small house in Saranac Lake, and despite occasional fevers, Trudeau felt well enough and returned to his career, beginning to treat patients in the area. And this was really the beginning of their life in the Adirondacks. Good food, open air and rest became the pillars of his recovery. As he saw himself improving, he began looking at his own recovery for ways to help others with tuberculosis. He diligently pushed for fresh air and true rest. Their recovery was to become their full-time job. Now, Trudeau wasn't the first person to acknowledge the importance of fresh air. The use of climate in general to treat consumption actually goes all the way back to Greek medicine. But at this point in the late 1800s, people all over the world were recognizing the benefits of fresh air. From his personal success, he felt inspired to create a space where others could really come to rest like he had been able to do so. So Trudeau developed the idea for the Adirondack Cottage Sanitarium. You're gonna hear me say both sanitarium and sanatorium throughout this presentation. Uh, because while Trudeau named it a sanitarium, 
it actually operated as what we know as a sanatorium. Sanitarium is often linked to institutions that treat mental disorders. Well, sanatorium comes from the Latin word sanare, which means to heal. And at the time when Trudeau established this institution, these words were really pretty interchangeable. Um, so that's what, why you'll hear both. Trudeau began raising money from wealthy patients and friends. After his first stay at Paul Smith's hotel, he had befriended many wealthy patrons who would vacation to the Adirondacks and many of them gladly donated to his cause. He had also befriended a group of Adirondack wilderness guides who generously purchased 16 acres of land for a total of $400. And they gave that land to Trudeau for the sanatorium. With the land secured and money trickling in, they began to build what would be known as cure cottages. Trudeau's vision was to establish these cure cottages for one to two patients. This would allow them to be isolated from lots of other patients, which is something Trudeau recognized as an important factor in recovery. In 1885, the first cure cottage was completed and it was named Little Red. Uh, Little Red was a one room cottage outfitted with two beds, two side tables and a wood stove. Alice and Mary Hall were the very first patients to be treated in the Little Red Cottage, and luckily they were cured and discharged. At the sanatorium, Trudeau wanted to treat his patients beyond just physical components. What were their spiritual, psychological, social, and biological needs for treatment as well? By 1887, a main building had been constructed and between 1885 and 1894, nine new cottages would be added to keep up with the growing demand. In 1887, the first railroad came to Saranac Lake, and this was a huge development for this little health resort. It allowed more people access to the secluded town. At this point, Trudeau cannot financially keep a physician on site. He lived 14 miles away at Paul Smith's, so twice a week, he made the trip in the summer uh, to check in on his patients. But once it had been built, the sanatorium quickly gained popularity and recognition. And Trudeau was the first physician to really capitalize on the concept of the fresh air cure. So with all these new patients and donors, Trudeau is finally able to hire new staff, acquire better equipment, and this contributed to the growing fame of Saranac Lake as a health resort. Because this was still all pretty experimental, the sanatorium could be selective with the consumption patients that it actually treated. Patients were admitted based on a few different criteria. Uh, the first is that those who, only those who were in the early stages of consumption were permitted. And this was because those individuals had the greatest chance of recovery, while those in later stages, they may fight for years, but Trudeau really felt that eventually they would succumb to the illness. Now, this was a really controversial tactic, and Trudeau did receive criticism for it. Many stated that because he admitted those in early stages with a higher chance of recovery, he was skewing the statistics re regarding recovery rates. And to this, Trudeau countered that in his experience, early diagnosis was the key to successful treatment. He just wanted as many people to live as, as he could help. Now, keep in mind that at this point in time, we know that TB is, we know what TB is and the bacteria that it comes from, but there's no specific medication. So Trudeau is really just doing what he thinks is best to save the lives that he can save. The other criteria for admission was financial mean. If patients could not pay for a boarding house in Saranac Lake to cure in, they could be admitted to one of the cottages. Uh, next, they were to have documentation that they were examined by an approved list of physicians or be examined by Trudeau himself to confirm a diagnosis of TB. There were several illnesses at this time that presented the same way that TB did. So this confirmation was actually a really important step. Uh, patients that were accepted into the sanatorium received medical care at no cost thanks to the aid of donors. They were to pay $5 a week for room and board, and it was 50 cents to launder a dozen pieces. 
Friends and family were open to visit at any time, but they could not stay longer than a week and they were charged a dollar per day. Any medicine that they needed could be procured in town at a significant discount. Trudeau also made house calls to the patients uh, renting cottages in town. So he was the doctor for, for all of Saranac Lake at this point. Upon their arrival at the sanatorium, patients remained in a reception cottage for 24 hours. They would be observed here and receive a complete physician's assessment. From there, their room assignment was based on the severity of their TB. They were always assigned a roommate that was at a similar stage. As they improved, they could be moved from cottage to cottage. Now, each move also came with a new prescription of exercise and freedom. And this actually created a homogenous healing and social environment for patients. Their treatment prescriptions were the most important part of their stay. And some allowed for small walks on the grounds while others directed that a patient not get out of bed and would actually be rolled out onto the porch um, in their bed while they needed fresh air. After a nine month stay, 73% of patients reported being cured. Keeping in mind that that statistic does reflect the fact that Trudeau only admitted patients in their early stages of TB. But for TB, like we've already said, that early diagnosis and treatment was essential to survival. In 1888, Trudeau and his wife welcome another child, Francis. This was quite the surprise as it had been 12 years since the birth of their son, Ned. That same fall that Francis was born, they sent their 16 year old daughter to a school in New York City. They wanted her to experience greater educational opportunities than the ones that were afforded in Saranac Lake at this time. But in January, Charlotte actually complained of feeling ill. And when she came home for Easter, Trudeau was able to diagnose her with tuberculosis. It was absolutely heartbreaking for him. She then died of tuberculosis in 1893. She was buried in Saranac Lake in a little churchyard where they had actually bur buried their infant, Henry, that they lost quickly after birth years earlier. The photo here is of Charlotte. Despite this heartbreak, the sanatorium continued to flourish. An open air pavilion was added for recreation and a cottage was built for, new, for a new resident physician. In 1892, Dr. Edward Baldwin came to the sanatorium to cure his own tuberculosis and ended up staying on as a physician. He would later go on to become the director of the laboratory. With a growing population, many of which had TB or were recovered, the village of Saranac Lake was incorporated in 1892. From 1894 to 1906, 10 more cottages were built and a water irrigation system was established. At this time, the very first registered nurse was also hired, Miss Ruth Collins. While doctors were an essential part to the sanatorium, conducting research and seeing patients as needed, it was the nurses who completed those daily tasks, those who sat on the patient bedsides and, and cared for them directly. New buildings on the campus included a much larger administration building, a non-denominational stone chapel, and a child's memorial infirmary. Now I've read that the view from the child's memorial infirmary was spectacular. Patients would have been rolled out onto the porch to receive their daily treatment of fresh air. And at the turn of the century, there were approximately 100 patients curing at the sanatorium. To keep up with the influx of patients, in 1901, Dr. Lawerson Brown became the resident physician as well. And he made the daily patient regimen a bit more strict. Now the daily schedule for patients was nearly the same day after day. There were variations in schedules depending on health. So patients with in better standing could take longer walks than those in worse condition. So as you can see here, this is the daily schedule. Lunch was used to indicate a snack and as you can see, the schedule really fell in line with Trudeau's pillars of recovery, rest, good food, and fresh air. Exercise was prescribed on an individual basis 
Some were allowed to walk for 15 minutes while others could walk for half an hour. While the schedule prescribed rest, it always meant rest in a reclined position with your feet up. This was so that there was no pressure on any part of the body. And to circle back to that, uh, to what I had mentioned earlier about patients being grouped um, based on their schedule to create that homogenous healing environment, this was so that they had a similar schedule that they could go through with another patient. They always felt like they had somebody with them instead of having a roommate that was completely bed bound while they were able to go out and go on walks. So they were always partnered with someone at a similar stage as them. Patients spent so much of their time resting or curing outside that special chairs were built for this exact purpose. The cure chair was the most important piece of furniture. The increase in outdoor curing necessitated better furniture. Initially, desk chairs were used, but they weren't comfortable for long periods of time. And so mattresses and cushioning were thrown over the chairs to help, but then they'd become top heavy and fall over. Again, it wasn't perfect. And patients were putting their feet up on, on whatever they could find, crates or anything stable. The concept of the sanatorium chair actually has its roots in Germany. Dr. Lawerson Brown saw what they were using and decided to bring this to the Adirondack Cottage Sanitarium. He reworked the design and the Adirondack recliner was born. Dr. Brown worked with George Stark to design a chair that supported the patient, had space to keep necessary items close and could easily be moved between inside and outside. Now the back of the chair could also be adjusted to lay flat or kept upright so the patient could just change positions if needed. And the chair was built quite sturdy because patients were spending the majority of their time curing in these chairs, hours upon hours each day. Some would even sleep overnight in these chairs. Patients would sit out on the porch in all weather, even 30 below, to get their daily dose of fresh air. For those cold days, blankets and buffalo coats were donated to keep patients warm. Now, curing on the porch of your cottage was standard practice for the sanitarium. But when the child's memorial infirmary was built on the property, the attached porch would be filled with patients each day receiving their fresh air cure because of that, that view. Now, this was often the patients confined to their bed. They would be rolled out of the infirmary and onto the porch to get their fresh air. The infirmary door was actually specially constructed so that the beds could easily fit through the doorway. As the years passed and patients continued to leave healthy, Saranac Lake is continuing to emerge as a pioneer health resort for the treatment of tuberculosis. Unfortunately, not every case could be treated with rest, food, and air. For more severe cases of TB, there were medical procedures that could be performed if deemed necessary. One of the treatments that was popular at this time was an artificial pneumothorax, also known as a collapsed lung. Now you may be wondering, why would collapsing a patient's lung count as treatment? In TB patients, the lungs are working overtime trying to give the patient enough air. Now, when they become too stressed, they can collapse. A procedure was actually designed to remove entire ribs from patients' chests in order to cause a partial or full lung collapse to happen. This was called a thoracoplasty. By forcing the lung to collapse, they believed that it provided a chance for the lung to rest and heal. Now, residents of Saranac Lake actually recall seeing patients walking walking around town with caved in chests as a result of this procedure. It wasn't one that you wanted to have done. This worked in some cases, but the procedure was later replaced by what's called a lobectomy, where part of the lung was surgically removed instead of the ribs. This procedure meant the body had less lung to heal, and so it would heal faster. That was the concept. It really had mixed success. Going back a bit, in the Middle Ages, people actually believed the best treatment was called the royal touch. They would line up for English and French kings and queens, hoping that a touch from them would result in a cure. I think this one had mixed results as well. In the early 1800s, cod liver oil, vinegar massages, 
and inhaling hemlock or turpentine were all thought to treat tuberculosis. Today, luckily, there are 10 different medications approved by the FDA for the treatment of TB. These work well, but it actually still takes months for patients to be free of this illness uh, and drug resistant strains have emerged, making treatment more difficult. At the sanatorium, the doctors and nurses felt it was essential to have patients maintain a positive and optimistic outlook at all times, in addition to their normal treatment plans. In 1904, a new magazine for patients was published and it was called Journal of the Outdoor Life. Patients would receive and read this magazine on a regular basis. While it was originally published on the grounds of the sanatorium, it was actually later taken over by the National Tuberculosis Association, and they moved it to their headquarters in New York City. This became the patient's national magazine, and it started in Saranac Lake. If you had tuberculosis, this was like your Bible. It held scientific articles and health information geared specifically towards patients and not geared towards doctors and nurses. There were poems, articles, letters written by patients, advertisements for TB-related fads, and tips that helped educate readers about the cure. This journal nourished their minds and spirits, really calling back to Trudeau's idea that to truly cure, you have to treat beyond just the physical needs. Dr. Brown began to engage patients in workshops, and this he had them doing arts and crafts outdoors. This was actually recorded as some of the earliest work in occupational therapy. Some of these crafts that patients got to participate in included book binding, leather work, wood carving, or illuminating. I actually had to look up what illuminating was, and my understanding that it's embellishing books or art with gold leaf or silver. So those are some of the cool things that they got to do. While the sanatorium, again, is flourishing, the Trudeaus suffer more heartbreak. In 1904, their son, Ned, passed from a pulmonary embolism. The community in Saranac Lake rallied behind the Trudeaus after they had committed 28 years to treating patients in this small town. Each business donated their time and effort to organize Ned's funeral. It didn't cost Dr. and Mrs. Trudeau a penny. Ned was then buried next to his siblings, Charlotte and Henry. And unfortunately, this wasn't the end of that suffering. From 1904 to 1915, we start to see a steady decline in Trudeau's health. Trudeau was incredibly successful, but his life was far from easy. After battling tuberculosis for more than 40 years, Trudeau died at the age of 67 on November 15th, 1915. He was buried next to his three children that had previously passed. By 1914, just a year before his passing, the endowment at the sanatorium grew to $600,000 and the free bed fund, which was established in 1888, continued to provide free care for many patients. So what he established in Saranac Lake was special and it continued to grow and help people many years after his death. In 1917, the Adirondack Cottage Sanitarium is renamed the Trudeau Sanatorium in his honor. In 1918, this statue is unveiled to honor his work. And as you can see, it has benches on either side so that people can sit with Trudeau. More cottages were constructed, as was a library, a reception and medical building, and a workshop building for continuing occupational therapy. And one of Trudeau's final contributions was a training school for nurses, which he had established in 1912. Now, the graduates from Trudeau's nursing program were in demand all over the country. When the D. Ogden Mills Training School first opened, which is what they had named it, students were only admitted if they had previously had TB and were now in what they called the arrested state. This meant that even if they have occasional symptoms, they're physically healthy. And the reason that they only admitted students who had previously had TB is because they're closer to the patient experience and they, could, they felt that they could better treat the patients with this mentality. In 
His son, Dr. Francis B. Trudeau, followed in his footsteps and worked at the sanatorium until it closed. In 1916, the Trudeau School of Tuberculosis was formed and became a nationally recognized tuberculosis consortium that included the sanitaria, hospitals, and laboratories in Saranac Lake. The goal was to find and diagnose TB in an earlier stage. The first six week course cost $150 to $200 and that included instruction, room and board. Now the most important part of their education was prevention. The prevention of the spread of TB was critical to resolving it. Now one of the ways in which physicians knew TB was spread was through sputum or spit. Improper acts involving sputum were actually grounds for being expelled from the program. And in the town of Saranac Lake itself, you could actually be fined $50 for spitting on the ground at this time. To prevent this, patients carried sputum cups that were fitted with cardboard liners. These would be collected by the nurses daily and analyzed if necessary. This wasn't the only method of sanitation. Cottages were kept as simple as possible to make cleaning easier. And every time a patient traded a room or traveled in a railroad car, a full disinfection was completed. By 1951, just five years before Francis's death, the original 16 acre property that the Adirondack Cottage Sanitarium sat on had expanded to 85 acres and consisted of 58 buildings. Some even called this the University of Tuberculosis. Dr. Francis Trudeau's son, Dr. Francis Trudeau Jr., again followed in his father's footsteps and opened the Trudeau Institute. This was a world-class center for basic research in immunology and infectious disease. The Trudeau Institute was ranked seventh on a list of 20 high-impact, independent, biological, and biomedical research institutions in the United States. Dr. Francis Trudeau Jr. died in 1995, and he was the last physician in his family line, but the legacy of what his family had created completely lived on. And today, the Trudeau Institute is still in operation, and the first cure cottage, Little Red, was actually moved to the Institute property in 1964, as was the Trudeau statue. What had been created in Saranac Lake made a massive impact on this town and on the patients themselves. Unlike many TB wards, patients adored their time spent here in the Adirondacks. Patients described their time as life-changing, and this actually led to reunions in the streets of Saranac Lake, scrapbooks full of mementos, and genuine gratitude for what their time with tuberculosis brought them. Many met their friends for life or even their partners while they were curing at the sanatorium. This photo is of several patients that were being treated at the sanatorium. And it just speaks to how happy they were even though they were all sick. The Institute held reunions in 1987, 1990 and 1993. If you travel to Saranac Lake today, you'll notice that many of the homes have porches on the first and second floors. And these houses likely would have held TB patients and they would have used those porches for curing. While we can't cover all of the different cases and all of the different patients, we can discuss what the general experience was like for patients on campus from some firsthand accounts. Anne Irene Remus arrived at the sanatorium in 1939 at the age of 23. Anne was a bedbound patient for eight years. In those eight years, she learned several new skills, including making a silver baby spoon for her godchild. It took her months to finish this spoon because she only worked on it for a few minutes each day. Even though she was curing from her bed, Anne still participated in leatherworking, painting, or doily making. Her favorite craft was oil painting. Anne painted the red barn on Smith Road at Trudeau after she was allowed her very first. 15 minute prescription walk after eight years in bed. Anne had a private room, but shared a porch with Isabel Smith. Isabel came to Saranac Lake in 1928 to cure, and she actually spent the next 20 years in bed. Despite being bedbound, 
Anne and Isabel loved the Trudeau Sanatorium. Anne was even subject to some of those procedures that we discussed earlier. They attempted to collapse her lung, but were unsuccessful. They removed several of her ribs, and they actually severed her phrenic nerve in a second attempt to collapse the lung, and that was also unsuccessful. Anne lived a long and full life, dying in 2008 at the age of 94, and she always maintained that her years at Trudeau were some of the best of her life. By the end of 1946, more than 15,000 patients had been treated at the sanatorium. After 70 years in operation, the sanatorium closed in 1954 as drug treatment for TB became pretty mainstream. In 1884, this little sanatorium in Saranac Lake was the very first of its kind. But by 1909, 352 private and state institutions for the treatment of tuberculosis were opened following Trudeau's original model. The photo that you see in the background here is actually in Colorado Springs. Colorado was another popular place for curing. And these individual houses would have been built for TB patients. In the end, and with scientific advancements that we've made over the decades, we now understand that Trudeau wasn't really curing anyone of tuberculosis. But what he was doing was providing an opportunity for people to cure themselves through genuine rest, an optimistic outlook, healthy food, and that fresh, fresh Adirondack air. In 2019, 8,916 people were diagnosed with TB in the United States alone. According to the World Health Organization, 10 million people were globally diagnosed with TB that same year, and it claimed upwards of 1.5 million lives. The countries most significantly impacted are parts of Asia, Africa, and South America. Like with any disease, TB has mutated and drug resistant strains continue to infect those that are susceptible. There is only one inaccuracy in this graphic from 2018, which is that now, COVID-19 has surpassed tuberculosis as the top infectious killer in the world. So that is how a small town in the Adirondacks became a world leader in tuberculosis research and treatment. Thank you for listening.